Welcome to Yield Nerd, an educational show about how you can acquire and manage yield. All right, Yield Nerds, thank you for your support. Episode 113, and I'm going to share my master tips on bottom fishing, something I'm trying to get good at. And hey, look at this, I can bottom fish in front of the New York Stock Exchange. Life is good. All right. Well, we're up to 279 subscribers. Thank you for your support. If you're new, I would suggest you look at the playlist. It starts from the knowledge level of somebody who is new to fixed income investing and brings them up to speed. And by the way, please remember, I don't have any magical powers. I'm often wrong. Check anything you hear here. Make your own decisions. Well, the agenda for today is threefold. First, I'm going to share where I believe the market is and is headed. Second, bottom fishing. And I'll explain what that means and how I'm using it in my equity investments in a very small portion of my equity portfolio at this point and my steps that I'm taking in terms of the next 90 days. Well, first of all, mea culpa, my portfolio on the face of it looks like it goes up, up and up. But the reality is I barely cracked 0.6% this year. So I missed a lot of the action. For the last six months, I'm up 3%. I guess I'm happy with that. I uh, never complain about, uh, you know, missing some giant rocket ship because that's not the kind of ride I'm in for. Speaking of rocket ships, if you had put your money on the S&P 500 for the last six months, look at this. 21.3%. Amazing. You missed the boat, fixed income investor. Even if you put your money in the S&P for just this year, year to date, you would have made 10.8%. Instead, you're making 0.6%. What is wrong with you, fixed income investor? You really need to rethink your strategy and you need to, uh, you know, figure out how to buy all these tech stocks and the growth stocks and the S&P. Maybe, maybe not. And in my humble opinion, the market today is not exactly connected to reality. NVIDIA's price to earnings ratio is a whopping 75.75. Seven stocks gained 70%, while the rest of the stocks were up 6%. And so if you think that is your jam, you do you. I'm going to stick to my uh, you know, fundamental analysis, and that is what I do. And for those of you that are new, it should be. You know, it, I want to make sure I acknowledge that my opinion is informed by my asset allocation. 96% of my portfolio is in fixed income and barely 4% is in equities. And so that 4%, however, I'm starting to play around to understand what I want to do. And uh, I will show you the list of stocks that I own. No NVIDIA, none of those. I love bottom fishing. Let me explain what bottom fishing is. And by the way, I made sure that even Dolly did not show me picking up Bitcoin and putting it into my basket. Not my jam. You do you if Bitcoin is your kind of deal. And uh, so my definition of bottom fishing, and before I get into that, I have to make sure I warn you that this is not investment advice. It is not tax advice. I am not a wealth management advisor. I also don't do politics product. I am sharing my education. And please take it at that. So one of the things, uh, one of the companies that has been pretty interesting to me is Intel. And Intel, as you can uh, see, you know, had a storied run. And I owned Intel until the beginning of the year. And uh, somehow I got lucky. I I dumped it at that time at a nice profit. And uh, I'm kind of getting back into it. And let me explain why. If you look at the fundamentals of Intel, It's a company whose revenue definitely has slowed down, but their equities have gone down by, I mean, their market cap has gone down by an enormous amount. And uh, their cash flow is also way down. That's because they aren't selling the hot ticket items. It's really the earnings per share where there has been devastation. And so you look at where should Intel go from here? And my humble opinion of Intel is that they probably need to start reinventing themselves, whether they'll be successful or not, how soon they will be successful. Those are the big questions. And it's possible, you know, with Apple, with all of its DOJ problems, with all of the focus towards reshoring into the United States, Intel may be a very interesting place where people take a look. 
And there is always the possibility that Intel is a little too big and they may want to spin off a division, create a joint venture. And so I'm kind of taking some interest in Intel early stages. Again, I, I want to make sure I'm throwing lunch money at Intel and, and trying to understand it better. And so that is one of the companies that catches my eye. And, you know, to kind of put more rigor into bottom fishing, here is how I define it. You know, looking at stocks that are yet to peak. Now, what does that mean? Um, I would say these are stocks and the folks who follow my show know that I only invest in U.S. stocks. I, I don't understand the international markets enough to do that. So I look for high volume for the simple reason that if the volume is low, the spread between the bid and the ask is too high. And so I don't like that. So I look for high volume. I do not like to pay a PE greater than 20. I also start looking at PEG, price to earnings growth, which is based on analyst predictions, which as you know, doesn't always mean anything. Uh, and then the important part is price to cash flow. If they generate a dollar in cash flow, how many dollars are you paying for that dollar in cash flow? Check out what that number is for NVIDIA and you do you. Price to sales, price to book and low debt. And so when you set all of that up on Schwab, and I'm not, you know, pitching Schwab. We're not sponsored by Schwab. I just happen to use it and I take screen prints and so I acknowledge it. When you set that up and say domestic companies with a trading volume above X, PE ratio, price to earnings growth, price to cash flow, price to sales and price to book and debt to equity. Uh, and I'm about to show you very specific stocks and I want to make sure some of these have product and politics undertones. So again, you do you. I'm only showing results of filters so these i would call the unloved few they they have all the markings of a cheap stock they may be cheap because they really don't have hope they may be cheap because the market may be ignoring it and the one i'm going to pick has a lot of history behind it a lot of negative press around it and that is under armor and under armor check that out down 65% over the last five years. And you look at really what's happening behind it and all the political stuff aside, all the controversies about the CEO side, their revenue is showing no indication of a problem. Their cash flow is actually on the, you know, comeback. Their earnings per share is on the comeback. And you look at that and go, what is happening? And the bottom fisher in me tries to look at that and go, here is a company that has lost two thirds of its market cap. It lost 13% last week because the founder CEO came back and there is some colorful controversies there. And I'm not one to you know, go into any of that. Google uh, that person and you will see what's going on. And so at this point, the founder CEO has a couple of choices. One is to say, I'm going to clear up these controversies. I'm going to emerge and show the market that you should be betting on me. I'm a changed person. Um, maybe they create a new product, new line. They may, they may catch lightning in a bottle twice. The stock is barely a third of what it was before. And the founder then says, I'm going to focus on shareholder return. Now, remember, the CEO owns 65% of voting control. So there's a little bit of dynamics here. And when I see stuff like that, a very underpriced stock where control is focused, it may lead to a couple of interesting paths. One is a potential sale of the company, if that's the best way to return uh, money to shareholders. It may attract the raiders. And there are corporate raiders who will say, oh, you know, that person is not giving a lot of return to the shareholders. I, with my 12 shares, I'm going to do it. And this has happened in other companies. And so my instinct, is that Under Armour has some of those underpinnings where it either is going to have this massive turnaround and win its customer, or it might divest a certain portion, or it may attract some people who think they can extract more value. So I did pick up some Under Armour, and I also picked up Murphy Oil and Intel. But remember, this is not a large portion of my portfolio at all. It is barely a pittance. But what am I doing with the bulk of my portfolio? I am back to bottom fishing in my strengths and my strength is in T-bills. So I was worried about April 30th, whether the two parties would collaborate. It looks like at the end of the day, we may have some common sense wins there at all. Uh, you know, it might get punted until September 30th. 
And so that's good news. There are some compromises. But, you know, like the rest of the market, I'm convinced as well that interest rates will go down at the end of the year, somewhere towards the year. I don't know by how much. I know I don't know when. And for many, many reasons, you don't want to wait until the first, you know, decrease in interest rates to extend your duration. You kind of want to do it a couple of months ahead. And I have started doing that. Let me explain what I mean by my table and chill comment and extending duration. I'm sticking to my knitting. I got back into tables. However, I have started laddering. Here are my buys and tables for the last week. As you can tell, I'm no longer only in three months. I've started buying six month, nine month, one year, and some two year as well. Uh, these pay only 5% right now. But if the FOMC starts saying it is time to decrease interest rates, there will be some very nice gains on some of these longer duration T-bills and, and notes rather, and that is the game I am playing. And so I am buying, you know, treasury notes and bonds that are in the two year, one year time frame, anticipating that there will be a drop in interest rates in the next three-ish months. My thesis is to take 20% of my portfolio and push it into 2025, into 2026 even. And the rest is still going to hang around the election time because unfortunately I expect some turbulence and that might create an equity opportunity. I'd like to buy more equities. I just don't want to pay a big price. But in the meanwhile, I keep a good chunk of it in the very short term because it pays 5.4% and hey, who would turn that down? And so my strategy at this point is to wait for a shock to the economy if there is one, otherwise enjoy very high, very short term three month bills while also increasing duration. That is me. Remember even a blind squirrel will find a nut once in a while. Remember to make your own decision. Thank you for watching Yield Nerd. Thank you for listening to Yield Nerd, a do-it-yourself show for yield accumulation and management. 